so uh, I'm Jeremy. Uh, this is my 10 minute, one of my 10 minute senior lectures. <laughs> and it's basically when somebody's allergic to penicillins, um, <laughs> what to do. So just gonna go over, when you say allergy, like it's a hypersensitivity reaction, just go over some of those. Uh, review chances of cross reactivity for some of the common uh, alternatives to penicillins and uh, also just go over some uh, alternate uh, antibiotic regimens. So the four types of hypersensitivity reactions. Uh, type 1, we all know that's the um, like histamine release, IgE mediated, that's your anaphylaxis at the severe end and on the more mild spectrum is your like allergic rhinitis. Um, and then uh, you have your type 2. Um, Kyle, you remember type 2, right? <laughs> so that's your uh, your <laughs> your antibody mediated uh, like cytotoxic. So that's like your antibodies uh, go on your like red blood cells, and then you get complement fixation. Your it's your drug induced hemolytic anemias, um, and then type three. Uh, that's your immune complex reactions, um, where you you basically you get. Deposition in like the post capillary venules, you get complement fixation, and that's like the fevers, arthralgias, um, serum sickness, which you can get from like the old, like you know, horse serum drive, but you can also get from some drugs. Uh, and the type, uh, type four, Molly, you remember the type four, what the type four uh, hypersensitivity reaction is? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> yeah, so it's well, yeah, it, it is, it, it's usually called delayed, but I realize like. Two, three, and four are also usually like kind of delayed reactions, but yeah, type four is also classic delayed. That's your cell mediated from on one end, just your like contact dermatitis up to your like Stevens Johnson's and uh, toxic epidermal uh, necrolysis. So usually, when somebody's like in most cases, when someone says they're allergic to something, um, they're usually referring to like the type one, the histamine release. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times people say like, oh, I bomb, you know, I threw up, or I had diarrhea, or I got a headache, or I got a yeast infection. Um, those in isolation, or obviously if they're having vomiting, diarrhea, and hypotension and urticaria, that's part of like an anaphylaxis syndrome. But if it's just isolated, they got some GI upset, um, <clears throat> that is not a true allergy. Um, and a lot of times we just see, like you look at the chart and it says penicillin, and you're like, okay, and then you're like, all right, I'm just not going to give them any penicillins. Um, <clears throat> but that's kind of a disservice. Um, like, I mean, obviously, if it's busy, like, you know, you're, you're sometimes you just don't have. I've had ID doctors like, you, why didn't you clarify the, what the reaction was? I'm like, well, because there's six hour wait, and like, I don't have <laughs> time to do that. But um, <clears throat> if you can, the reason to like clarify what the allergy is, there's a 2013 <clears throat> uh, study where they basically looked at. People, if someone had penicillin allergy on their chart before they got admitted, um, they were more likely to get C. diff, they were more likely to get MRSA, they were more likely to get the uh, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, and they uh, stayed in the hospital longer. Um, so <clears throat> if it says penicillin on their chart, and you say, you know, oh, what was your reaction? And they're like, oh, like, you know, I threw up, and that was it. It might be worth taking that off the chart because, you know, you also, you know, and then and then that's like they're more likely to get like the bigger guns, the more broad spectrum when maybe they don't need that. Um, so if they're actually not allergic and it says that they are, it would be worth it to go in and like actually change it uh, and say, so, okay, you know, they're not, or, or or change it from allergy to like um, reaction, like adverse drug reaction, or however it classifies it in Epic. So <clears throat> usually, you know, the. Um, one of the alternatives to, you know, if someone's allergic to penicillin, we usually think about, because uh, it has similar coverage, moving on to cephalosporins. They're also beta-lactam uh, antibiotics. Um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of um, kind of like, con like how many times you go to order like ceftriaxone on someone with a penicillin allergy, and that warning in Epic pops up, and it's like, you know, in like red, and it's like high alert, like danger, person reports, and then, you know, you write your little comment, and the pharmacy still calls you, and you have to clarify, but <clears throat> so a lot of like the initial thing used to be, oh, 10% of everybody allergic to penicillins will have uh, an allergic reaction to a cephalosporin. A lot of those initial studies with like the first generation cephalosporins, the uh, production processes were actually not as refined. So you actually, in a lot of the 
original first generation cephalosporins were getting contamination of them with actual penicillin. Um, so they think that that's why a lot of people, when cephalosporins first came out, um, before they kind of refined the, reduction, the production process, were having all these allergies. So we have your, well actually it's like there's five generations now. I think the fifth is like ceftaroline, but we, I don't think it's really available in any of our hospitals, at least not from the ER. So your first generation cephalosporins, which is your cephalexin, your keflex, your cefazolin, that's the ANCEF, those are first generation and those are kind of the greatest, like the, the greatest risk. It's still probably less than 10%, um, but it's still there. And the, the thing that actually the cross reactivity is not the beta lactam ring, it's actually the side chain. Um, so like uh, the first and second generation cephalosporins uh, actually have similar side cha chains to, actually it's uh, like amoxicillin and ampicillin are the ones that um, they're the most similar to. So then <clears throat> your second generation, your cefoxetin, um, <clears throat> it's lower risk, but still like generally if someone has a true penicillin allergy, most people will uh, avoid your first and second generation cephalosporins. Um, <clears throat> once you get to your third and your fourth, um, it's like very low. Um, third generation, your ceftriaxone, your ceftonir. We usually don't use ceftonir a whole lot, but it is, it's a PO third generation cephalosporin, so um, it's actually a good drug. Um, it's like, <laughs> it, it, yeah, yeah, so depending on their insurance. Um, <clears throat> and that's like a zero to one percent. Sometimes it's like 0.7. Yeah, Shazia? <clears throat> so I, I kind of talk about that like in my next slide. I mean, I've, I have given third and fourth generation cephalosporins to people with anaphylaxis um, because it's such a low risk. I don't think I would send someone home with ceftonir if they had a history of like anaphylaxis um, to penicillins, but like they're sitting in front of me in the ER, it's such a low risk. Um, I, obviously if there's a safe alternative, all right, maybe I'll just use the alternative, but like if it's really kind of like the best drug. Um, and then your, your fourth generation, the cefepime, it's like negligible, it's like even lower than third, it's close to 0%. Um, the same with your fifth generation. Um, <coughs> the, the reaction to like a third generation of your penicillin, is that any higher than the reaction to some other antibiotic? So, well, I mean, that, that's the other thing. Like, if you have this like atopic individual that's like allergic to like every drug, yeah, they might have an allergy, but it might not have anything to do with the similarity in the structure. It might just be because there's not, a, it's usually the side chain and the side chains aren't similar. It could just be because they're allergic to that and doxy and, you know, they just are allergic to, and peanuts and strawberries and everything else. Um, <coughs> So, um, so yeah, I mean, the, and there's, you know, I mean, everyone has penicillin allergy, so uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it depends. And so then you also you have your, we don't use, I feel like we don't use the carbapenems a whole lot, the imipenem and mirapenem. Um, they're, they're low risk, um, but they do have some similar side chains, so they are generally avoided in people that have anaphylaxis to penicillins. And then your monobactam, like as trianam, it's actually like very low uh, immunogenic potential. There's no cross reactivity between. So, if someone's allergic to penicillins, it's fine to give them uh, as trianam. Uh, one thing that if some we again we don't use these a whole lot, but ceftazidime, it's a third generation cephalosporin, is actually very similar to as trianam. So, I've never seen someone have a ceftazidime allergy on their chart, but if they did, you wouldn't use. Um, I'd probably avoid penicillins and uh, and as trianam. You'd have to go um, uh, other classes. So, in terms of um, what Shazi asked, like. If someone has a serious type 2 to type 4 reaction, like Stevens Johnson's, hemolytic anemia, serum sickness, I actually had someone at Weiler the other day, I was like, oh, what's your allergy to penicillin? And they were like, oh, I get Stevens Johnson syndrome. I was like, okay, so in that person, <clears throat> I would consider. I would recommend consider avoiding all cephalosporins uh, and carbapenems altogether, although as trianam, okay to use, which is what I ended up using in that patient. Um, <clears throat> if it's anaphylaxis, um, Again, you know, I wrote consider avoiding your first and generations, uh, first and second gen uh, cephalosporins and your carbapenems. Um, I usually will use like the third and fourth generation cephalosporins, um, but uh, again, I probably wouldn't send somebody home on that. So quickly, <clears throat> case: 65-year-old male, history of diabetes, hypertension, COPD, coming in with fever, cough, dyspnea. He has a right lower lobe infiltrate. Admitted last week for IV antibiotics for diverticulitis. Um, Patrick, what antibiotic do you think you would probably use on this guy? Um, right lower lobe. He has no, no allergies. No allergies. Then, yeah, with the right lower lobe, then you would consider like a... Like a or right lower lobe 
So yeah, I mean, this is like, it's HCAP, right? He was admitted last week. He got IV antibiotics. You're treating HCAP. <coughs> so a lot, a lot of these people <coughs> are going to get, um, as I say, good old you know, VZA. I mean, you, you, know, you, may, you may argue you don't really need, oh, I forgot I have this thing. You may not need the atypical coverage um, <coughs> because you know, atypicals usually aren't part of the um, uh, HCAP. But so usually, you're, like, these people are getting as kind of like reflex, they get vancomycin. That's your gram positive coverage, your, uh, including your MRSA. We love Zosin. <clears throat> I mean, it's a great drug. It has really broad coverage. You get your gram positives, your gram negatives, your pseudomonas, and your anaerobes, which is why, I mean, it covers all those. And then azithro um, uh, is atypicals and some gram positives. There's like a lot of resistance for strep pneumo, so that's also why it's maybe not the best drug to send somebody home with if they have like a focal infiltrate and you're treating, sending them home for a community acquired pneumonia. And some people, um, like IDSA guidelines, if you have pseudomonas risk factors, like if you're a bad COPD or frequent steroids, we'll actually recommend double pseudomonal coverage where you'd even be adding like a, a quinolone on top of this. But if someone has a penicillin allergy, so we can't give the Zosin. It's piperacillin, tazobactam. So for HCAP, there's like a couple different choices. Um, you have your cefepime, which is your fourth generation cephalosporin, which gets your gram positives, your gram negatives, your pseudomonals coverage, but no anaerobes. Um, and then again, like if somebody has Stevens Johnson's, maybe you wouldn't give the cefepime, but you could give as trianam. Um, gives your gram negative, your pseudomonas, um, no anaerobes, and no gram positive. The gram positive isn't as big of a deal because if you're giving it in conjunction with the vancomycin, uh, and then the you have your quinolones, uh, gram positive, gram negative. Um, pseudomonas atypicals. Um, moxifloxacin actually does get anaerobic coverage, but like uh, levofloxacin and ciprofloxacin do not. So if you're if you're suspecting like aspiration pneumonia, um, you would need to add uh, flagyl or metronidazole or clinda to cover for your anaerobes. <clears throat> we usually like clinda out of all the antibiotics is like the highest risk of C diff. Um, so yeah, I mean you could give clinda, um, you know, for like an aspiration pneumonia, um, but. <laughs> It, it is such a high rate of C. diff that like, if you can avoid giving it, you would. So you could give like flagyl for your um, anaerobic coverage. And then finishing up, just a couple other like common, usually it's like the ENT stuff that is like, you know, we're giving uh, penicillins where you have your otitis media. Um, if someone, you, you're sending them out and they have a penicillin allergy, um, you know, you can, the cefpidoxime or septinir, those are the third generation cephalosporins. Again, if it's like, I get a little bit rash, you're probably fine. If they get anaphylaxis and uh, angioedema, then, you know, you could give a quinolone. Again, you know, now there's, we really want to kind of like avoid quinolones because of all the side effects. So if you can avoid, if you have another alternative, it's better to give that. And then your strep pharyngitis. Um, you know, if you're not giving penicillin or amoxicillin, you can give um, azithromycin or pioclinda. Um, and then for your bacterial sinusitis, if you're going to tre be treating it, you can give doxy um, and uh, also fluoroquinolones if you have to. But I always have fluoroquin fluoroquinolones listed up there last if you're going to be giving them because uh, um, they do have like a pretty high side effect profile. Um, that's it. Anybody have any questions? Cool. Yeah.